Hubble will die one day. Obviously, Hubble the person is already dead, but <laughs> the Hubble telescope will die one day and we have to both be mentally and astronomically prepared. Something will wear out on Hubble Space Telescope, basically. Either calibration lamps or some of the fuel to change which direction it's pointing in, it will eventually stop working. We will no longer be able to get images from Hubble. Sunrise uh, over the Hubble Space Telescope, illuminating the golden solar rays. Those rays uh, to be retracted uh, for the final time uh, a few hours from now. NASA, ESA and the Canadian Space Telescope have got a new Hubble in the pipeline. It's called James Webb Space Telescope and uh, this is what it looks like. It's infrared, not optical, unlike Hubble, so it's not going to be a true follow-up because Hubble looks in the UV and the optical and in the infrared, whereas James Webb will look out to the very far infrared. James Webb will be at the Lagrange 2 point, so I know that 60 Symbols has done a Lagrangian video before, but basically a Lagrange point is a stable point in a two-body system. So we have the Sun and we have the Earth, the Earth is going around the Sun, and basically there are five points in those orbits at which if you put something, it wouldn't move relative to the Earth and Sun, so it would stay where it was. So L2 is sort of beyond Earth, away from the Sun, and basically it will have a 365 day year, the same as the Earth, but it will be orbiting further out. It will be launched in Ariane 5, which is a really, really successful ESA rocket. And then they're going to give it a little burst, and that'll get it, get it enough energy to get to L2, but really, really slowly. So what they'll do is, it's kind of like going up a hill, if you will. So they'll give it enough energy to boost it up the hill, but so much so that it'll slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down until it reaches the very top, at which point it will stop. And the like, thing like, is... Like a really good putt. Yeah, like a really, really good putt, yeah. Um, that just sort of stops right on the edge and then falls in. In that time, the antenna will fold out so it can talk to Earth, and then the whole thing moves upwards as well, and it's called the spacecraft bus, they call it. The whole thing will move up and make room for all of the equipment down below. The sun shields will all fold out as well. This is this huge tennis court sized five layer intricate sun shield. This, which we call the secondary mirror, so what happens is light comes in here, bounces off here, bounces onto the secondary and then into the center where it's detected. That will also be up here during launch and will get folded down to the right position. The mirror itself, so this segmented array, will also fold out from being folded up inside the rocket. So what they've had to do is they've had to design the shape of the mirror so that it is the wrong shape at room temperature, but by the time that it gets to like the vacuum of space, it will cool and warp to the right shape. It feels like they've made this too complicated. Like, they seem like they've been too ambitious. Am I wrong? I, I get that feeling as well, but I think it's because I, I, I'm not a, an engineer, a space scientist engineer, so I can't comprehend what is too complicated. You know, let's leave it for the, the, literally the rocket scientists to tell us, you know, what's too complicated. They have such belief that this will work. So the astronomical community, you know, has faith in them and says, okay, well, this is what I want to do with it then. There's a huge long list of things that could go wrong. It could just blow up being trying to be launched. The, the antenna couldn't even fold out. The sun shields might not deploy properly. The mirror might not fold out properly. The secondary mirror might not fold out properly. The whole thing might not move up, it might jam. Like the cryostat to cool everything might not come on. The electronics might be fried. It might get shook up too much that it might not work. I mean, it's kind of terrifying trying to list everything that might go wrong, but also exciting because they've had to think about how can we stop that from happening. There's about 10 brand new technologies that have gone into JWST that haven't been tested before. Everything's already built. You know, everything's being tested repeatedly uh, at NASA Goddard, which is you know, the Washington DC area. Um, their vibration testing, they are testing the solar shields, the, how they pull out. Someone said to me that the, the test, they'd seen it happen the other day, but it took two weeks for the solar shields to fully open up. Said it was like watching paint dry <laughs> because you'd go for lunch, come back, and they wouldn't look like they moved at all. Um, it's going, undergoing so much rigorous testing to make sure that everything can stand up to the launch and fold out in the, you know, the sort of situation that it needs to.
Hubble was optical and UV. It had stuff that it could specifically do, but it's limited. It can only see so far. And that's because obviously, if you imagine stars and galaxies are always giving off optical light, the further away they are, the more that light is redshifted. And so Hubble can't actually see the very distant galaxies because there's nothing really in the optical wave lens that it can see anymore. So we have to look in the infrared. I printed out these to show you. So this is the optical image of the Eagle Nebula taken by Hubble. It is my favorite Hubble image. It is beautiful. It's of a star forming region in the Milky Way. You can see all the dust clouds. It's absolutely beautiful. On your right, yeah, okay, <laughs> is the infrared image from Hubble as well. And although the optical one is more sort of visually spectacular, the infrared one is more scientifically spectacular because you can see through all the dust and the gas that's in this nebula. And so you can learn more from the infrared image than you can from the optical. Obviously, to get enough light from an object, you have to stare at it incessantly. And the idea with James Webb is that it's got such a big mirror, 6.5 meters as opposed to you know, Hubble's 2.4, that you don't have to stare for very long at all. So they, one of the uh, quotes I remember was that if you took the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is infrared as well, it did an entire survey of galaxies and it took something like 550 hours of observing time. That's just actually staring at the sky. That's not including all the time it takes to repoint the telescope. If you were to do the exact same survey again with James Webb, it would take 30 minutes. The other thing it's going to be able to do, what people hope it will be able to do, is to detect the first signs of life in our universe you know, beyond our own planet, obviously. I mean, I'm not talking about sort of, you know, contacting ET or little green men here. What I'm talking about is biosignatures. You know, this is the idea that you will be able to detect in that atmosphere, say, water or oxygen or carbon dioxide. Something that we know on Earth is a signature that life is here. The way that they've detected exoplanets in the past is to have the exoplanet's star here. If you're sort of the Kepler spacecraft, which is the one that's been detecting all these exoplanets, and I am the star, then what happens is you're observing light from me, and you're like, yep, there's a star there, there's definitely a star there, and then a planet moves across uh, my face, and basically it will produce a tiny little dip in my brightness, um, in which case you'd be like, oh, planet there. What they'll do now is they'll wait for it to transit, and they'll wait for the, the light from the star to pass through a teeny tiny bit of the atmosphere of that planet. And then they will take that light and split it into its rainbow, into its spectra. They'll take off the light from the star and they'll be left with the absorption spectra of the atmosphere of that planet. Even if we were very confident that we had detected signs of life in an atmosphere, and we said, okay, this is definitely sort of like Earth, the most Earth-like we could possibly ever find. Say it's a, a, a star exactly like the sun and it's an Earth size and an Earth you know, radius planet and everything and it's got ozone and it's got H2O and it's got CO2, everything. It might be 10,000 light years away. And it, if we were ever have, gonna have a conversation with these people, <laughs> I call them people, <laughs> with this life, if they were intelligent life, it would take us 10,000 years to send a signal and for them to receive it and 10,000 years to come back. So it would be a 20,000 year wait for the other side of the conversation. In the paper there's, you know, the most Earth-like planet every six months. And either that'll be the most Earth-like from its mass or from its radius or from the distance it orbits around its star or for the fact that the star is the same as the sun. We've never really found one that fits all of those criteria at once. It's pretty scary because it won't launch till October 2018 but they already have science proposals in. If you want to do something very specific that's your science, the call for proposals is November this year. So everybody is already starting to think, what will I do? How will I observe this? How long will it take me? Because you have to put all that in the proposal before someone decides yes or no, you, don't, you do or don't get time, before it's even launched, no, before it's even gone to the launch site. Like it won't even be in French Guyana before people put in 
telescope proposals. I bet those people are going to be nervous when it launches. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> if your sort of scientific career future prospects are, you know, dependent on you getting the James Webb Space Telescope time, you need that thing to work. Portion of the spectrum. Uh, we feel right now that there's probably no real science that we can do with the wide field camera at this time. And I'll stop there. But the thing about Hubble is that it was launched into low Earth orbit and it was always intended that it would be visited by astronauts. And so a few years later, one of...